I don't know. Um, that's, oh. a, that's a good question. I mean, like. I thought I'd still. In, uh, in, in, there's, there's a key. Uh, I was thinking about it the other day. The key element that I see in it is why is it that there are people, I mean, many of us have been molested or, or mm -hmm. physically abused, but what's the difference? And I noticed that in the, in the kids, there's uh, not only a, a constant, almost daily, like one kid, every time he came home from school, he'd get beaten. And that takes care of school. So any kind of thinking, any mind activity was removed. And then the household itself was There wasn't reading. It wasn't. It was a, a real practical lifestyle. Very poor socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that makes a so difference. But. Have you had any? Uh, have you ever worked with anyone who gained anything from the work you've done with them? Yeah. Oh. Is that because you were able to beat them? No. No, okay, okay. They, they, they felt like I was. Okay. Uh, through were you pushing this yeah. curious thing called understanding? Yes. Yeah, huh. they liked it. Yeah, yeah. How is it that understanding can have an effect on such traumas? The, comment, the comments that the kids make when we outline it on the board is uh, one, uh, I remember clearly saying, uh, gee, this is a relief. It's like this whole burden, this whole weight just left me. And he said that it was uh, because he, um, he didn't realize that talking about it just talking about it was helpful. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how his language. He thought that he could he couldn't talk about it. He shouldn't talk about it. Yeah. But just talking about it, he didn't realize could bring that kind of relief. Because he didn't say it's it likely if there is any uh, <clears throat> severe behavior in the past, uh, there is that code of silence to protect the person. Mm -hmm. Always code Always. Of Always. That, that's They're the, bound by an oath of silence to protect the perpetrator. The uh, the gang mentality has that element. Oh. That if you're loyal and you don't protect. We have one kid who is just, uh, his whole family comes to make sure that he's loyal. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's a family gathering every weekend to assure that there is a cap on anything he's doing. No. You know, it would be worthwhile if we could get you from 8 to 10 to perhaps disguise, of course, the identity of one of the people you work with and take us through a particular case, you see. Because then people then can see, right? Because if she's worked with them, we know that the way in which she approaches things is with sufficient precision that she's going to ask the kinds of questions that make the person reflect in such a way and, and bring about changes and we can all work together and wonder about it, why talking about it in a particular way can bring about changes. Be worthwhile if you don't... No, I don't mind. I don't think I'm... <laughs> Not tonight. I mean, there's, there's lots of people here that you've gone through with problems that are problems. No, there, nobody here has there. problems that I know of. No, you're problem free. I well, used to, there are a lot of people uh, here that have... No, he's just waves. He's just <laughs> waving. No, I got a problem. No, I had, while you guys were talking, I, I was thinking of three scenes that I've explored in Midwife Talks that all, that I wanted to think of as formative pathologo scenes, and every single one of them has fear as a major component, such that I'm sitting here thinking, this is why I still have a problem, because I haven't found that particular scene where, you know, even though I was real young in these other scenes where fear isn't playing that big of a role no. or intimidation or abuse. Yeah. And yeah, we've got the... That's the, same, that's the same question I have too. Is scenes with abuse are easier to... You know, they have stronger memories, but 
how do you identify? Is I mean, the identif it seems a different process of identifying the pathologists from scenes with abuse than with scenes where they are, are where the kid doesn't know or when you you know when you don't know exactly what's going on, like you said, but you blame yourself for. I mean, a person always knows enough to solve their problem because whatever they can recall is sufficient to keep them in the problem. Mm -hmm. Is the process of identifying... Is that your end? Yeah, go ahead. That's so cool. Is, a, is the process of identifying similar to the ones that are more obvious, like with scenes of abuse? Um, like, if, if you're identifying a problem of a pathologist, when it doesn't come from a scene, say, with, a, with an intense abuse of a scene, is it a different process of identifying that pathologus, or is it, is it similar? That's right. I don't know. Let's take one. Yeah, that's right. Same issue, sir. Yeah. Take, let's take one and see. Let's oh. find examples, and, okay, and from point. the examples conclude. Then we're way ahead. But to answer in, categorically, independent of exploring it, it's not too beneficial. I'll just say from my own experience, I yeah. think it flows throws some light on what we were talking about, which is that sometimes I could remember just a bit of a scene, and it turned out that yeah. that bit, whatever it was, was enough to understand sure. uh, the nature of the problem at that po point. And then later, like maybe a couple of years later, it could be five years, I would uh, be working on something and would hit a problem. Would It would go back to that scene, but when I remembered it that time, I could see more of it. I could remember more of it. Because it was kind of interesting. It was like there was more. So I think that you remember as much as you need for whatever yeah. problem you're working on, yeah. as was just said. And then if you, if, the, if there are more aspects to it as you try to understand the whole problem, you'll, uh, you'll uncover more. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good way to open up memory. Say, do you want to get into the figures? Because uh, a couple of pages, yes. because just... Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. mm. Oh, pleasure, pleasure. Yeah. Um, okay. No, I just want to know. That's their own so no, but I have, to, I, I have to get shots of this sign here hey, um, at the beginning of every recording. Right? No, you're not. I just wanted, I just was concerned that not because I didn't want to hear you. No, no, that's not it at all, Ingmar. I simply wanted to communicate to you if you were saying something you didn't want recorded, oh, that it was going on. That's it. Not I'm not at the point yet where I'm forming a militia and collecting assault rifles. I don't really care what if anyone records what I have to say about my game. But I appreciate it, Barbara. I appreciate your explanation. I was thinking at uh, 257 is the end of Socrates' speech. And I thought we'd pick it up right after that and do a couple of pages because uh, it's pretty empty. There's really nothing of significance going on, and therefore we can go through it quickly. Because, you know, this was one of the nights when he was writing, he was tired, and there was nothing really going on, so we can go through it quickly. Uh, All right? I mean, there's... And it's pretty obvious, and therefore the reason he put it in there is at that time he was writing so, for so many drachma or word and making a buck out of it. <laughs> yeah. Because at that time, very few people knew how to write ancient Greek because they weren't that old. That's right. You have to be very old to write ancient Greek. Is that right, David? There was a few of them. <laughs> so, look here. Let's even prove it. All right, there's an, we're going to pick up what appears to be a dialogue. It's pretty frivolous, nothing serious, and we can ignore it. But since we have nothing else to do, we might as well spend some time doing the obvious, all right? Mm -hmm. 257C. In my book, that's page 505. 
So Socrates just gave this long speech. And then Phaedra, Phaedrus comes in, <clears throat> because Socrates just <clears throat> ended his speech with a kind of prayer, a kind of prayer. <laughs> And so that Phaedrus picks up that theme and he introduces the subject. Here he is for those of you who need visual arts. <laughs> Speech writing. Or, right. Very interesting, um, actually, speech writer. Because Socrates just gave a speech. And so he says, hey, you know what? I want to bring up the subject of speech writers. And obviously there's nothing going on, but what the heck, we've got some time to waste. We might as well do it, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, <clears throat> if we have a couple of people who want to read, we can play. One, two. Which one do you want to be? I'll be Phaedrus. Which one? Phaedrus. Phaedrus, come on up. Now, if either of you decide to get a dramatic career going, I get 10%. <laughs> Finder's feet. Oh, it's getting me. Is this good, Barbara? You yeah, set it up? They're fine. Can't even find the Read slowly, was it? Yes. And we play by the same rule. You can stop. You can stop them wherever you want. Good luck. For questions or things of that nature. <laughs> okay. And would you not agree? Could you move your chairs just a little bit closer together? Yeah, sure. You don't have to be, you know, yes, thank you. You just discussed how we're lovers in the kitchen, so. That those who read know what they're reading, and therefore they can be called upon at any time. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's true. Yeah. What it is they're reading. Any sentence. Yes, yes, yes. Fair? Fair? Anything I don't know, my Fair. brother knows. Anyone have an extra <laughs> copy of a book? Would Tom, you'd have a copy? No, I don't. Anyone got an extra Phaedrus? Often someone has more than one. I have a Thomas Taylor version. Okay. Well, here, he can... He probably is... He could use... Tom and Tony. Tony. No, I can share. Hmm? Is, that, is that the lobe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's got a copy of the lobe. Oh, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you point out where we're at? Okay. Oh. 505. Oh. Five. Uh, Who's got the most reading? I do. Good. But you got a big paragraph. Where? Right at the beginning. Oh, no, that's fine. Page 505. I can do it. I can do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay? Good. Okay, cool. Okay. When you guys are ready, let the music begin. Commercial. You ready, you know? Yeah. All right. I join in your prayer, Socrates, and pray that this may come to pass, if this is best for us. But all along I have been wondering, at your discourse, you made it so much more beautiful than the first, so that I am afraid Lysias will make a poor showing, if he consents to complete with it. Indeed, lately one of the politicians was abusing him for this very thing and through all his abusive speech, kept calling him a speechwriter. So perhaps out of pride, he may refrain from writing. That is an absurd idea, young man, and you are greatly mistaken in your friend if you think he is so much afraid of noise. Perhaps, too, you think the man who abused him believed what he was saying. He seemed to believe, Socrates, and you know yourself that the most influential and important men in our city are ashamed to write speeches and leave writings behind them through fear of being called sophists by poster, posterity. Yeah. You seem to be unacquainted with the sweet elbow, Phaedrus, and besides the elbow, you seem not to know that the proudest of the statesmen are most fond of writing and of leaving writings behind them 
since they care so much for praise that when they write a speech they add at the beginning the names of those who praise them in each instance. What do you mean? I don't understand. You don't understand that the name of the approver is written first in the writings of, the st of statesmen? How so? The writer says, it was voted by the Senate, or the people, or both, and so-and-so moved, mentioning his own name with great dignity and praise. Then after that he goes on, displaying his own wisdom to his approvers, and sometimes making a very long document. Does it seem to you that a thing of that sort is anything else than a written speech? No, certainly not. Then if this speech is approved, the writer leaves the theater in great delight, but if it is not recorded, and he is not granted the p privilege of speech writing, and is not considered worthy to be an author, he is grieved, and his friends with him. Decidedly. Evidently not because they despise the profession, but because they admire it. To be sure. Well then, in, when an orator or a king is able to rival the greatness of Lycurgus, or Solon, or Darius, and attain immortality as a writer in the state, does he not while living think himself equal to the gods, and has not posterity the same opinion of him when they see his writings? Very true. Do you think then that any of the statesmen, no matter how ill-disposed toward Lysias, no matter how ill-disposed toward Lysias, reproaches him for being a writer? It is not likely, according to what you say, for he would be casting reproach upon that which he himself desire, desires to be. And that is clear to all that writing speeches is not in itself a disgrace. How can it be? But the disgrace, I fancy, consists in speaking or writing not well, but disgracefully and badly. Evidently. What then is the method of writing well or badly? Do we want to question Lysias about this? And anyone else who ever has written or will write anything, whether a public or private document, in verse or in prose, be he poet or ordinary man? You ask if we want to question them? What else should one live for, so to speak, but for such pleasures? Certainly not for those which cannot be enjoyed without previous pain, which is the case with nearly all bodily pleasures, and causes them to be justly called slavish. We have plenty of time, apparently, and besides, the locusts seem to be looking down upon us as they sing and talk with each other in the heat. Now if they should see us not conversing at midday, but like most people, dozing, lulled to sleep by their song because of our mental indolence, they would quite justly laugh at us, thinking that some slaves had come to their resort and were slumbering about the fountain at noon like sheep. But if they see us conversing and sailing past them unmoved by the charm of their siren voices, perhaps they will be pleased and give us the gift which the gods bestowed on them to give to men. What is this gift? I don't seem to have heard of it. It is quite improper for a lover of the muses never to have heard of such things. The story goes that these locusts were once men before the birth of the muses, and when the muses were born and song appeared, some of the men were so overcome with delight that they sang and sang, forgetting food and drink, until at last unconsciously they died. From them the locust tribe afterwards arose, and they have this gift from the muses, that from the time of their birth they need no sustenance, but sing continually, without food or drink until they die, when they go to the muses and report who honors each of them on earth. They tell Terpsichore of those who have honored her in dances, and make them dearer to her. They gain the favor of Erato for the po poets of love, and that of the other muses for their votaries, according to their various ways of honoring them. And to Calliope, the eldest of the muses, and to Urania, who is next to her, they make report of those who pass their lives in philosophy, and who worship these muses who are most concerned with heaven, and with thought divine and human and whose music is the sweetest. So for, so for many reasons we ought to talk and not sleep in the noontime. Yes, we ought to talk. We should then, as we were proposing just now, discuss the theory of good or bad speaking and writing. Clearly. If a speech is to be good, must not the mind of the speaker know the truth about the matters of which he is to speak? On that point, Socrates, I have heard that one who is just to be an orator does not need to know what is really just, but what would seem just to the multitude who are to pass judgment, 
and not what is really good or noble, but what will seem to be so. For they say that persuasion comes from what seems to be true, not from the truth. Well, the word, phages, which the wise speak, must not be rejected. But we must see if they are right. So we must not pass by this which you just said. You're right. Let us then examine it in this way. How so? If I should urge you to buy a horse and fight against the invaders, and neither of us knew what a horse was, but I merely knew this about you, that Phaedrus thinks a horse is one of the tame animals which has the longest ears. It would be ridiculous, Socrates. No, not yet. But if I tried to persuade you in all seriousness, composing a speech in praise of the ass, which I called a horse, and saying that the beast was a most valuable possession at home and in war, that you could use him as a mount in battle, and that he was able to carry baggage and was useful for many other purposes. Then it would be supremely ridiculous. But is it not better to be ridiculous than to be clever and an enemy? To be sure. Then when the orator who does not know what good and evil are undertakes to persuade a state which is equally ignorant, not by praising the shadow of an ass under the name of a horse, but by praising evil under the name of good, and having studied the opinions of the multitude, persuades them to do evil instead of good, what harvest do you suppose his oratory will reap thereafter from the seed he has sown? No, no very good harvest. Well, do you think we have approached the art of speaking too harshly? Uh, perhaps you might say, Why do you talk such nonsense, you strange men? I do not compel anyone to learn to speak without knowing the truth. But if my advice is of any value, he learns that first, and then acquires me. So what I claim is this, that without my help, the knowledge of the truth does not give the art of persuasion. And will she be right in saying this? Yes, if the arguments that are coming against her testify that she is an art. For I seem, as it were, to hear some arguments approaching and protesting that she is lying and is not an art, but a craft devoid of art. A real art of speaking, says the Laconian, which does not seize hold of truth, does not exist and never will. We have need of these arguments, Socrates. Bring them here and examine their words and their meaning. Come here, then, noble creatures, and persuade the fair young Phaedrus that unless he pay proper attention to philosophy, he will never be able to speak properly about anything. And let Phaedrus answer. Ask your questions. Is not rhetoric in its entire nature an art which leads the soul by means of words, not only in law courts and the various other public assemblies, but in private companies as well? And is it not the same when concerned with small things as with great? And properly speaking, no more to be esteemed in importance than in trifling matters. Is this what you have heard? No, by Zeus, not that exactly. <laughs> but the art of speaking and writing is exercised chiefly in lawsuits and that of speaking also in public assemblies. I have never heard any further uses. Then you have heard only of the treatises on rhetoric by Nestor and Odysseus, which they wrote when they had nothing to do at Troy. And you have not heard of that by Palamides. Nor of Nestor's either, unless you are disguising Gorgias under the name of Nestor, and Thrasymachus under, or Theodorus under that of Odysseus. Per perhaps I am. However, never mind them. But tell me, what do the parties in a lawsuit do in court? Do they not contend in speech, or what shall we say they do? Exactly that. About the just and the unjust? Yes. Then he who speaking as an art will make the same thing appear to the same persons at one time just, and at another, if he wishes, unjust. Certainly. And in political speaking, he will make the same thing seem to the state, at one time good, and at another, the opposite. Just so. Do we know, do we not know, that the Iliadic Palamides, Zeno, has such an art of speaking, that the same things appear to his hearers to be alike and unlike, one and many, stationary <clears throat> and in motion? Certainly then the art of contention in speech is not confined to courts and political gatherings. But apparently, if it is an art at all, <coughs> if it is an art at all, it would be one and the same in all kinds of speaking. The art by which a man will be able to, re to produce a resemblance between all things between which it can be produced. 
and to bring to the light the resemblances produced and disguised by anyone else. What do you mean by that? I think it will be plain if we examine the matter in this way. Is deception easier when there is much difference between things or when there is little? When there is little. And if you make a transition by small steps from anything to its opposite, you will be more likely to escape detection than if you proceed by leaps and bounds. Of course. Then he who is to deceive another and is not to be deceived himself must know accurately the similarity and dissimilarity of things. Yes, he must. Nor will he be able, not knowing the truth about a given thing, to recognize in other things the great or small degree of likeness to that which he does not know. It is impossible. In the case, then, of those whose opinions are at variance with facts and who are deceived, this error evidently slips in through some resemblances. It does happen in that way. Then he who does not understand the real nature of things will not possess the art of making his hearers pass from one thing to its opposite by leading them through the intervening resemblances or of avoiding such deception himself. Never in the world. Then, my friend, he who knows not the truth but pursues opinions will, it seems, attain an art of speech which is ridiculous and not an art at all. Probably. Shall we look in the speech of Lysias, which you have with you, and in what I said, and in what I said, for something which we think shows art, and the lack of art? By all means, for now our talk is too abstract, since we lack sufficient examples. And, and by some special good fortune, as it seems, the two discourses contain an example of the way in which one who knows the truth may lead his hearers on with playful words, and I, Phaedrus, think the divinities of the place are the cause thereof. And perhaps, too, the prophets of the muses, who are singing above our heads, may have granted this boon to us by inspiration. At any rate, I possess no art of speaking. Okay. So, okay. so now they come into an examination of the speech of Lysias that Phaedrus had tucked under his sleeve and was recording was recording it right so memorizing it this is a waste of time what we just read five pages a totally a waste of time there was no point really worth it maybe the couple of pages before that when they start talking about likeness so let me go back and cheat a bit and, and knock off a little bit of that at 262 which is where we left left off. Um, I think in all fairness we can maybe take two pages off of it and say maybe 257 to 260. It's really nothing significant going on there. Therefore, what I thought we could do is just cut it out. All right, and just skip it. Agree? <laughs> oh, come on, come on. Wait, wait. wait no, what was that principle we started with? Was it not the people who read it should be able to explain? Yes, sir, sir. Yes, sir. Don't you agree with me? There's nothing philosophically going on that was worth anything up to. Right from 257C to 260, uh, I mean, it's just padding, and he was writing at so many drachma a word, so we can just drop this as filling. Bill. No. Pretty empty, isn't it? I mean, nothing. Yeah. No, he's just the scene. <clears throat> okay, then, all right. Agree? No. Well, what you find, then in that case, tell us what you found significant in those pages. Uh, Good beginning. Go ahead. <laughs> First of all, Good. Uh, mm. so in the first, the first thing that happens, Socrates, I don't know if he midwives Phaedrus, but he immediately chastises the idea that Phaedrus brings up that, that there's something shameful about writing challenges him about his notion and then proceeds to defend writing 
and speaking. So he speech defends writing. speech writing. What has that got to do with the whole thing that they're engaged in? Nothing. Did he come to any <laughs> conclusions? Did he come to any conclusions that we can talk about as, as, as if it were important? Yes, I agree. Starts with the idea of speech writers, <laughs> and Socrates then defends speech writers. <laughs> Does it need he, okay, the question? See, yeah. but, like, does it need it? But then he knocks him down and says, "This may not be an art. It may be some sort of artifice or yeah, or yeah." Then he he praises it and then puts it down. I totally agree. Which shows the man isn't too sensible at this point when he <laughs> praises and condemns and within the same few pages. Good. I like people agreeing with me. That shows they're intelligent. That's the point. <laughs> well, how else do you know whether someone's intelligent unless they agree with you? <coughs> God, you guys are terrible. Um, okay, then we all agree we can skip it and just pick it up from this point. Yeah. No. I agree with you that, you know, other than a good subtraction problem where you end up with three, um, there's not a lot there. I read it twice this week. It's The only thing that seems to be important are the question of speaking the truth and the problem of likeness. But the problem, when does the problem of likeness emerge? Does that go from 260 to 262? Because I agree with you. There is the subject of likeness that is picked up from 260 to 262 C. Yeah, he just agreed with you, Pierre. Good, therefore... Drop out everything before that. Yeah, therefore we can <laughs> drop out that other section as irrelevant and another example of Socrates goofing off. <laughs> Good, I agree. I think it's one of the worst passages in Plato ever. I disagree. Ah. I disagree with David. Well, point out the value of this stuff. Go ahead. Well, what point did he make that you thought was worthwhile? Um, so, should I ignore... Yes. Uh, when he starts talking about... Um, when he says at 258D, uh, it is clear to all that writing speeches is not itself a disgrace... And then he goes on and says, but the disgrace, I fancy, consists in speaking or writing not well, but disgracefully and badly. Should I not consider that? Am I, have I gone too far there? Because that, I think, is very important. You're yeah, going to tell us why. What's so hot about it? Um, because he's not just talking about speaking. He's talking about writing also. And as uh, far as I can tell, oh wait, that's right, and that, um, I'm glad you thought it was right without telling us what you thought was right. Uh, look, look here, look here. Would you agree so far, this guy is Phaedrus. He gave a speech which was nothing other than this guy's speech. At the end he says, hey, you know what? Lysias has been criticized as being merely a speechwriter. Okay, I got it. Agree? Yes, yes. Is this the, this the drum? Yes, yes. yes. Now, then Socrates then, <laughs> since this is a negative, hey, he's nothing but, let me put that as, Lysias is nothing but, A speech writer. So Socrates comes back and he says, uh, excuse me, uh, on the contrary. He agrees. Then he disagrees with it. He says, oh, no, no, no. To say that a person is merely a speech writer misses the point. And therefore he gives him a positive view Of speech writers. Mm -hmm. Agree? So what? So what's so hot about that? No. Go. 
Well, go ahead. I need help. Well, he says that positive. What's so hot about that? Yeah. What's hot about that is that um, he's supplying evidence that, first of all, Phaedrus's notion is ridiculous, right? He's not. He's saying, Phaedrus, look, your notion's so I ridiculous. I don't think you should say it's ridiculous. I agreed with him. No, no. <laughs> but you got to let me finish. Oh, 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 oh. Right? Go ahead. He's saying, it's like he's, he's saying, Phaedrus, your notion's ridiculous because you're not looking at your own experience. I mean, the greatest people in the state aren't saying what you're saying. Right? So that shows an insufficient attention to the details of his own life, of uh, how people relate to this, this speech writing. Now, that, that's what immediately came up in this, you know. See, there's, I have no argument against that. Matter of fact, I even like the way you stated it. Okay. Now we want to know why that fits into the dialogue called the Phaedra, well, since it doesn't appear to well, be significant. Hold on. Yeah, Dan, wait, but that, that, is that a question for me? Because I can answer that. Right. Well, while he had raised his hand, but before right, so you, he's trying to answer the question that that, that give him a that be properly given to me. No, no, no. <laughs> given no, that, no, given no, no. You paused. His hand went up. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no. no he's, but you I, don't mind. Get me, he, Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I think many of us might recall that there's an, an art of an art of rhetoric that's described later on. Yeah. Um, I, I can get these acts of honest, but I'll just say. Good. Don't. It. it, it it's. It requires us to distinguish, well, first of all, know the truth about any particular subject that we're speaking of, and then to distinguish between all those different souls that there are, distinguish all, uh, and make the distinction. You're so right. And make the distinction about all the different types of men oh, you're that so those right. different types of souls correspond to. What does that got to do with I'm this? I'm not done yet. Oh, and then okay. further make the distinction about all the different types of speech they are, there are, and, 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 and to be able to match up the different type of speech with a different type of soul and also distinguish the times for speaking well and the times for not speaking at all or the times for speaking or not speaking at all. Uh, and here he is using a mode of speech to counter Phaedrus' view about the art of speech uh, and, and to, to, to defend speech and to show him eventually that there's a proper way of doing it and an improper way of doing it, not just speaking but speaking and writing. Um, and so, in action, he's doing what he says is part of the art of rhetoric in this particular example, and I think that's a decent shot at it at this okay. point. So. <laughs> I, I, I like your argument. If you consider everything that came after this, then this piece is justified. It lines with all of the different distinctions North Carolina. Is that right? Yes. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm talking about the art of rhetoric. That's I know that. Yeah. But our question is, I agree with you, you have stated the art of rhetoric. Can you please show us how this fits the description you just gave of the art of rhetoric? Yeah, he went up again. He's back. And he paused too, right? He did pause. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. He's helping. <laughs> okay, well, I might get hammered for interpreting. Hammered. Here, but, uh, hammered for <laughs> interpreting. <laughs> yes. I'll, wait a minute, I'll let Jacqueline do that. <laughs> But in in the past, uh, tell us where you're at. Okay, okay, from the whole the whole section. The whole good. Okay. But uh, in the in the past, I have thought that uh, the part from the beginning, right there, at 257C, I join in your prayer. I thought, okay, he he, Faders makes his speech, or he makes his his claim, sort of a uh, compliment to the to yeah. Socrates' big speech. And then this other I did think of as kind of fluff before. Um, but, but the way that, um, you know, as, as kind of a little bit, um, almost like he took too long to connect it up with that next part of the dialogue. But what I was just looking at it now is as uh, almost like if you take the, uh, if, you, if you take what it seems as though Phaedrus is uh, acknowledging, that there are these uh, that there are these people that uh, that uh, make fun of Lysias because he is a, a speechwriter, and then Socrates' response to that that he's only uh, that they have something that they consider <coughs> beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's not it's it's appearing to be not sophist. And so, it, in, in my view, it, and this is where I'm going to get hammered, I think, for interpreting, but it's that there's, 
that he's going through a kind of uh, of view of what appears to be beautiful to to those people. In this case, the the politicians. Um, no. Okay. I go along with not, that. He's not done, Pierre. Don't ask me how it fits. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. But he was in mid sentence. Wait a minute. I think yes. Uh, have you? Paused sufficiently. I paused sufficiently, but I'm, I'm going to come. I'll come back to it. Okay, uh, to conclude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because it needs one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please. One, two. Go ahead. All the well, as I was listening, Leonard. one of the things yeah. that kind of struck me is that the the very people who are referring to Lysias as a speechwriter. Socrates then goes about showing how they do things in terms of uh, resolved by the council and proposed by so and so, and those were the very people who were calling Lysias yeah, look. a speechwriter. Yeah, would you not agree? Uh, Come on. Are you kind of showing the hypocrisy there? I uh, might be. Let's see if we agree. Here is the speech that this guy gave. Would you agree? He gets an F for it, in terms of the dialogue. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you agree that our friend Phaedrus, at the end of Socrates' speech, which is where we're at, right. agrees? He says, yeah, well, you know, Lysias is really nothing other than a speech writer. He's agreeing with the F, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Right. And now he's going to show that speech writers do not belong in the class of F writers? You find that rather curious or not? Some don't. Not all. Uh, do you find that curious? In what way? You state it. If they both agree that, see, F. Does that mean he's nothing but a speechwriter? He agrees it's an F. Now, what would you what do you think Socrates should do after that? Should he not then, if he's going to grade and justify the grade, say, okay, now let's look into Lysias' speech and I'll tell you why the dude gets an F. Right? Does he, he but he doesn't. He no. gives us this. Six pages or five pages that we just read, that has nothing to do with Lysias' speech. <laughs> David. Well, I don't want to sound homosexual or anything. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Got our Could attention. Could be getting yeah. there. <laughs> go ahead, David. But, <laughs> with one T, not two. Um, <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> he seems to be making an analogy uh -oh. in part of this speech. I, I, I was thumbing while you were talking there. Uh, between talking about a jackass, an ass, that's right, and <coughs> the truth. That's right. He says, and he starts with, you first must know the truth, but let's just say, you know that an ass is an animal with long uh, that that an that an animal with long ears appears to be something useful and more. Uh -huh. And then he says, "What's worse? Suppose you have no knowledge between the difference between a horse and an ass, and then you made that speech anyway. Isn't that exactly what <coughs> Phaedrus does? Socrates' copy of Phaedrus' speech, and then Socrates' speech himself." Socrates knows the truth. Socrates pretends to know what a jackass looks like and then tries to convince um, of what love is. Excuse me, we're going to... Let's, let's... In this section, you have to substitute ass for love. That's the homosexual thing. Mm -hmm. um, Socrates is to Phaedrus as a horse Socrates is to a jackass? Is the truth as Phaedrus, as, as mm -hmm. Socrates is mockery is to assuming love is a appearance of the truth as Phaedrus is to not knowing the difference between the two 
and confusing them completely. I just, I mean, there has to be some. No, no. 257 to 260 is just a preamble. But at, at 260, when he begins to make those distinctions, he's, he's doing the same thing he did in, in, in the three speeches. He's saying, and then he concludes by saying, you can't get there without going through me. And that's where I'd like to go. That's the weird part. Here, why are you nicer to David yeah. than us? <laughs> <laughs> How come you haven't rejected him yet? Should not resort wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> You're being interrupted. But Egmar has a point. I can make, but this boast I can make without me, even the man who is thoroughly familiar with the fact will not be, will not, will be not a bit near the art of persuasion. So there's two things going on. One is, He's made a distinction between truth, mistaking the truth, and not knowing the truth at all. And then, and then he goes that transition, and I just, that's all I see. Okay, and your point is? My point is, number one, okay, you wanted us, originally, you are like, okay, 257C to 262C, mm -hmm. you wanted to reject that whole section. Mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. I think upon reflection, you saw it's going to be tougher mm -hmm. to reject the 260 to 262C. So my first point is that David's reasoning is within 260 to 262C, and we're supposed to defend 257C through 259E mm -hmm. right, first. Mm -hmm. right, so it's a... It's a, it's, he just it's a made procedural. It. He's taking the easier one. Pardon, pardon no, no. He used this to go back to this section. Okay. That's I'll, the force of his it, remark. Did I miss that part? No. How, how did you take it back? To that section? 257 to 260? To 259, no, end of 259, yeah. <coughs> it's a preamble. Yeah, but how did you take it back? <coughs> what do you mean? Oh, I, Pierre said that you connected it, so. He did, but he may not have realized it. Hmm. Um, I may not have realized it. I, 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 I think 257 to 260 is a preamble and uh, a further in, invocation. But I think he begins at, 250, at 260 with his criticism of speech making. The, 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 the thing about the cricket. Yeah, I was saying that we, we, have to defend, yeah. we have to defend 257 <coughs> through the end of 259, too, right? You can't. Right, that you were saying that earlier. You do you think can't. that's no, all. You, there's nothing to defend. It's just fluff. And you, no, it's a lovely story. Well, you uh, then you agree with Pierre that we could take it out and it wouldn't mar the perfection of the whole Phaedrus. Well, let's go back there later. Oh, okay. Mm. I, I, excuse me, you're right. I did jump ahead. Okay. It sets the stage. It, it, okay. Do we want to do the muses right now? Yeah. Like right, right is now. That, is that what you're talking about? We should be talking about the muses? Because I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. I don't mind. But look here, we're, we're still on the same thing, right? We want to see why this man wants to pick up Lysias' speech at this point. All right? That was our goal, all right? Why the five pages? I added the notion that there is a section on likeness that precedes it. Let us even take that out. And we're only left then with this section, which is 257 to 260. Yeah. Well, this kind of goes back to what I was trying to say earlier, but uh, the I saw this part here, uh, even though it's in 262, I think it, it has to do with why the 257 to 260 has to be there. But I saw that him saying uh, the horse as an analogy, that it, he does, he actually throws in Phaedrus. He doesn't just say, if one believes, which he oftentimes does. He'll say, if, if someone believes this, then that, this, then that. He says, if Phaedrus believes, which I thought was kind of interesting, because he doesn't always put the person's name in there. But in, in the beginning of, of, the, of the whole thing, Phaedrus is carrying something that he thinks is the most beautiful thing that he's ever beheld uh, right the speech the of, of Lysias then after hearing Socrates speech he, he then says oh he's laughing at it saying oh it's just a speech 
So it seems kind of like uh, Socrates needs this this part here to to uh, to not just to show that oh. speeches need to be there, but to show that it's not a pro it's more of a problem of having a wrong conception of what is beautiful, not the the, the medium, I guess. By okay, let me let me see if I can justify what we're doing. Okay, let me justify what I'm doing. From the text, right? from the text. Certainly, the major part of this text deals with this word likeness. Right. That's the key. All right. Now, I am saying that there's something really trivial that takes place between these two. Am I not? Yes or no? Yes. 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 yes, yes. I am making the claim that you could really say this is, in principle, not absurd, but trivial. Now, I want to see if I can justify it and see whether or not we can use the text to help understand it. All right? Principle, 261. The art of rhetoric. Jump into it, okay? We have need of these arguments, Socrates. Bring them here and examine their words and their meaning. Come here, then, noble creatures, and persuade the fair young Phaedrus that unless he pay proper attention to philosophy, he'll never be able to speak properly about anything. And let Phaedrus answer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ask your questions. It's not rhetoric in its entire nature, an art which leads, leads the soul by means of words, not only in law courts and in various other public assemblages, but in private companies as well. And is it not the same when concerned with small things as with great? And is it not the same when concerned with small things as with great? And properly speaking, mm -hmm. no more to be esteemed in important than in trifling matters. This is trifling, see? He says it's trifling. Therefore, whatever is going on here, that there, there should be a way of understanding on a higher level. That is to say, it only appears trifling. This is where we're going. Why do you say that he says that it's trifling? Pardon me? Why does he say it? Sorry. Because <laughs> That's the art of rhetoric. Because you should be able, if you have it, to be able to see both, the small and the great. Absolutely. Yeah. But why? How is it that he's saying that Sections 257 and through 260 and the things that he said sure. there are trifling. He doesn't. He just gave the example of it. I'm, I'm suggesting, yes. I'm not following. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. What came before I'm saying is trifling, which is what I've been saying all evening. That's what you said. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm saying, therefore, let's take the challenge. Okay. Can you see the same thing in the small as in the great? <laughs> this is small, trifling. <laughs> Right? You should be able to see some principle that's going on on a higher level. Should you not? Yeah. It should be a leading of the soul in the small as well as in the That's greater. right. Yeah. Right. So in this section, Socrates should be leading the soul. Mm -hmm. ah, through this. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't, isn't he leading the soul from away from uh, the appearance versus reality in that section. Like the, the speech writers are concerned about their image. That's and not, true. And not the reality of their writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, isn't Socrates, uh, well maybe Socrates is leading the soul that way that instead of focusing on the image of the writer to focus on the the 
their words. Right. Thank you, yes. And he's replacing the model. In a way, then, this justifies what he's going to be doing. Because that's what he's going to do with Lysias' speech. Yes, you had your hand up. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if it's right, but um, doesn't he make a distinction also and say that um, they, can make, they can give the appearance of something, they can make something sound good, but it's not necessarily true. It doesn't necessarily have the truth in it. That's certainly there. Mm -hmm. That's certainly there. So look here, let me suggest something. What if we just reread it? The same section. And see what he's doing. Because, would you not also agree, through this, he has a lot of fun. There's a lot of fun sections in this. And he makes up he makes up names for people. He makes up a, a little story about the locusts and everything. Right? He's having a lot of fun, isn't he? An elegant fun. Intelligent fun. No, I said I said elegant. But that's trifle. Why is that trifle? Well, if people look. I, I just noticed a group of girls having fun earlier, okay. and it wasn't elegant. So I don't know that. It's that what do you say? We go into it. <laughs> How about it? Huh? They're just idiots. You know? Teenagers having fun. Wow. Yeah, I think it's worth it to distinguish between different types of fun, isn't it? No. Please make your point louder. I said it's worth it to distinguish between different types of fun. Yes, I certainly agree with you. And he's having it. Yeah, but a different kind of fun. Yeah. Okay. Um. Gonna get new readers. Should we get our same team back and uh, do it again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you want to do Does someone else want to sell? Uh, Does anybody else want to do Socrates too? I'll do it. <laughs> I won't wait. <laughs> If you don't mind a small request, I wouldn't mind if you slowed it down. Right oh, now. my God. Just I guess I'm getting old anymore. <laughs> no, I just don't. Yeah. Oh, just a little. Just pause. I just, you know, I've done a lot of reading, you know, in my adult life out loud. You guys know that well. And I just don't remember an occasion where I've been chastised. Or at least requested yeah. to slow down so many times <laughs> within two make week more, period. All right, then make it more dramatic. Is that an invitation? Make it more dramatic. Make it more dramatic. Huh? <clears throat> so, let me raise the question. No, hey. Maybe a misperception. Uh, how about this one? Just because you get an F. Does that mean you have to quit? No. Hey, just because you got an F, right? Does that mean you should? Would, could, must, quit? What is, what is Phaedrus' opening remark after hearing Socrates' speech about the very speech he read of Lysias? Okay, let's go. I join in your prayer, Socrates, and pray that this may come to pass, if this is best for us. But all along I have been wondering at your discourse you made it so much more beautiful than the first so that I am afraid Lysias will not will make a poor showing if he consents to compete with it indeed lately one of the politicians was abusing him for this very thing 
and through all his abusive speech, kept calling him a speechwriter. <laughs> so perhaps out of pride, he may refrain from writing. What's his view? What's his view of the life shows? He should give up. Yeah. 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 He should quit. He should quit. He may, in fact, yeah. He may. Is that this problem? Yes. Mm -hmm. Out of ah, he's so pride. disloyal. <laughs> Out of pride. What, sir? Out of pride. Yeah. 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 Out of pride, he'll quit because mm -hmm. he got him an F. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Socrates. That is an absurd idea, young man, and you are greatly mistaken in your friend if you think he is so much afraid of noise. Perhaps, too, you think the man who abused him believed what he was saying. He seemed to believe, Socrates, and you know yourself that the most influential and important men in our cities are ashamed to write speeches and leave writings behind them through fear of being called sophists by posterity. Yeah. No. no Fs. That's a different right he's adding. I fear of being called a sophist. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You seem to be unacquainted with the sweet elbow, Phaedrus, and besides the elbow, you seem not to know that the proudest of the statesmen are most fond of writing and of leaving writings behind them since they care so much for praise that when they write, write a speech they add at the beginning the names of those who praise them in each instance. What do you mean? I don't understand. You don't understand that the name of the approver is written first in the writings of statesmen? How so? The writer says it was voted by the Senate or the people or both and so and so moved mentioning his own name with great dignity and praise and after that he goes on displaying his own wisdom to his approvers and sometimes making a very long document. Does it seem to you that a thing of that sort is anything else than a written speech? So no. What is he attacking? What is yeah. he attacking? What is he attacking now? Vanity. Nars Here. Narcissism. Right. Vanity. <clears throat> right. Taking it out. Go ahead. Fluff. <clears throat> no, certainly not. Then if this speech is approved, the writer leaves the theater in a state of great delight. But if it is not recorded, and he is not granted the privilege of speech writing, and is not considered worthy to be an author, then he is grieved, and his friends are with him too. Decidedly. Evident Therefore you're saying the reality is they fear exile. rejection. Rejection. And right, and not getting the public's applause. Go ahead and being forgotten. Evidently not because they despise the profession, but because they admire it. To be sure. Well then, when an orator or a king is able to rival the greatness of Lycurgus, or Solon, or Darius, and attain immortality as a writer in the state, does he not, while living, think himself equal to the gods, and has not posterity the same opinion of him when they see his writings? Very true. Do you think then that any of the politicians and statesmen, no matter how ill disposed toward Lysias, reproaches him for being a writer? It is not likely, according to what you say, for he would be casting reproach upon that which he himself desires to be. Okay, then, what did he reach? A rejection of his view. Right. Pre yeah. yeah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Looking at it, what did he just saw? What did you just see? He saw that the reasoning he had, Phaedrus had, comes to a... Sorry. Well, he has to... Thank you. The, the, the reasoning he, the, that the account he had given, or the statement he had given, is shown to be untrue. That's right. A refutation. Shallow. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he led yeah. him to yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he led him to that. He led him to the rejection yeah. of his first view. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, then that is clear to all that writing speeches is not in itself a disgrace. How can it be? But the disgrace, I fancy, consists in speaking or writing not beautifully, but disgracefully and badly. New subject, right? right. 
New subject. What's the subject now? The beauty and quality of what you write. Right. Evidently. What then is the method of writing elegantly or badly? Do we want to question Lysias about this? And anyone else who has ever, who ever has written or will write anything, whether a public or private document, in verse or in prose, be he poet, hey, ordinary man. What's what's the issue now? How can you judge? Right, judging. All right, what do you want to do? Is there a method of writing that's either well or done badly? Mm. Looking for standards. Columns. New subject. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm. You ask if we want to question them, what else should one live for, so to speak, but such pleasures? Certainly not for those which cannot be enjoyed without previous pain, which is the case with nearly all bodily pleasures and causes them to be just, called slavish. Just, justly. What did he do to the, come on, what did he do to the issue? The mm. issue on the table is, it's necessary to judge writing in such a way that you can see whether it's done well or whether it's done badly. Mm -hmm. And what's his position now that he reflects on and Phaedrus comes back with? Mm. Jumps in. It's He's the greatest saying, pleasure. Yeah, let's do it. Greatest pleasure. Yeah. Uh, trumps, all Change. Bodily, trumps all bodily pleasures. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, how did he do with the question? Mm -hmm. He's advancing it. No, he well, didn't no. deal with it. He, he didn't, didn't deal with it. He didn't answer it. He's, He's praising it. He's saying go, praising. Socrates. He's praising it. He's praising it. That he loves hearing speeches. It gives him a pleasure, doesn't it? He just focuses on pleasure, not on whether it's done well or right, mm -hmm. or badly. Right. Poorly. Yeah. Yeah. It just goes Which along is a, with the yeah. other bodily functions. Pardon? It just goes along with the other bodily yeah. functions. Yeah. That's right. He groups it he with groups bodily it. pleasures. Well, like yeah. how people love to read in the bathroom. Right. Yeah. Don't <laughs> criticize my pleasure when I get pleasure out of. Yeah. Because that's what he did. Uh huh. He tried, he's memorizing uh -huh. that speech of, of Lysias. Right. Of Lysias. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Now, what does Socrates do? He has to deal with that, doesn't he? Yeah. By giving him what some. What does he have to deal with? A lazy ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lazy ass. Right. 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 Yeah. He's coming out like an ass, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And he doesn't know the difference between gotcha. a horse good a horse and bad. Yeah. So he gives him a way of understanding his own laziness. That's right. By pleasing him. Now let's see what he does. Go ahead. Sing well, you like <laughs> you like good speeches? Well, I'll give you another one. Yeah. Go ahead. Have a locust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only he doesn't, he won't notice that it happens to be a good one. Go That's ahead. right. We have plenty of time, apparently. And besides, the locusts seem to be looking down upon us as they sing and talk with each other in the heat. Now, if they should see us not conversing at midday, but like most people, dozing, lulled to sleep by their song because of our mental laziness, they would quite justly laugh at us, thinking that some slaves had come to their resort and were slumbering about the fountain at noon like sheep. But if they see us conversing and sailing past them, unmoved by the charm of their siren voices, perhaps they will be pleased and give us the gift which the gods bestowed on them to give to men. Well, is that exactly the way in which yeah. Phaedrus was responding to this issue? Mm. He was dozing off? <laughs> yep. Right, what did Socrates do with it? He takes his state of mind or his response and he weaves the story around it, doesn't he? Yes. And he finds that very pleasurable, of course. Well, <laughs> this is a gift. I don't seem to have heard of it. Well, <laughs> well still... Which, well, no, I'm just, it's possible because he's been dozing or Socrates made it up. No. <laughs> yeah. Comparing locusts. While, while, while still uh, composed, while at the same time uh, weaving a transition to the topic. No, let's go. Okay, uh, now? No. Okay. It is quite improper for a lover of the muses never to have heard of such things. The story goes that these locusts were once men before the birth of the muses, and when the muses were born and song appeared, some of the men were so overcome with delight that they sang and sang, forgetting food and drink, until at last unconsciously they died. From them the locust tribe afterwards arose, and they have this gift from the muses, that from the time of their birth they need no sustenance, but sing continually without food or drink until they die. When pleasure, they go, pleasure. 
<laughs> when they go to the muses and report who honors each of them on earth, they tell Terpsichore of those who have honored her in dances and make them dearer to her. They gain the favor of Erato for the poets of love and that of the other muses for their votaries according to their various ways of honoring them, and to Calliope, the eldest of the muses, and to Urania, who is next to her, they make a report of those who pass their lives in philosophy, and who worship these muses, who are most concerned with heaven, and with thought divine and human, and whose music is the sweetest. So for many reasons we ought to talk and not sleep in the noontime. Yes, we ought to talk. Yeah. <laughs> what did he just do? He said, hey, yeah, there are a lot of pleasures. The highest one is philosophy. Well, we should be good. conversing. Mm. It's got the whole scale going all the way up. Go ahead. We, sh we should then, as we were proposing just now, discuss the th theory of, of speaking elegantly and writing so. Clearly. If a speech is to be good, Carlos... Must not the mind of the speaker know the truth about the matters of which he is to speak? On that point, Socrates, I have heard that one who is to be in order does not need to know what is really just, just what seems just to the multitude who are to pass judgment, and not what is really good or noble, but what will seem to be so. For they say that persuasion comes from what seems to be true, not the truth itself. Uh, hey, what... Right, this is his position. This is his new position. Why doesn't they forget about truth? Just Give them appearances. Seeming. Yeah. Seeming. Yes, yes, seeming. Persuasion yeah. comes from seeming to be true, not from the truth. But to the multitude. And the multitude. Yeah. The oh, mul yeah. yeah. That's his position. seem to that the happens. Yeah. His position. Yeah. Okay, what is now? Okay, Socrates has to take off on that. Let's see it. Well, the word phaedrus which the wise speak must not be rejected, but we must see if they are right. So we must not pass by this which you just said. He takes his response, does he not? And he's going to examine it. And if it needs to be rejected, he will reject it, won't he? Well, yes. Even though it may be just dropped in casually, suddenly, he suddenly discovers, hey, there's someone around who's listening to what's being said. Mm -hmm. right. well, Socrates knows it needs to be rejected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember a discussion I once had some time ago when the guy looked at me and said, Oh my God, you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the experience he's having. But. <laughs> he's listening. He's, he's used to talking he's, to other dozing people. Yeah, he's dozing, right? He's been dozing. And but, other people, the people he talked to are yeah. dozing. Everybody's dozing. Okay. But that's, Dozers. yeah, that's not enough, though, right? Like, there are... It is not enough. Well, what, right. I, what I mean by that is when you say that, that Socrates is listening, aren't there plenty of instances where Socrates does not pick up what a person says? And yeah, and I could probably it. mention many of them if I knew them. <laughs> But for so, lack of you, Ingmar could mention it. Well, oh. I just I seem to remember that 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 does occur. I, I suppose the reason why I'm saying this is because I think he picks it up because it's he instantly recognizes that in regards to their subject matter, what Phaedrus just brought up is something that he needs to reject, and that I mean, come on, what did what did what did Phaedrus just bring up? But. The way rhetoric, rhetoric is practiced that a philosopher finds most abhorrent. Right? I mean, what's, what's, what's involved here in, in what he just said, this appearing to the multitude to be just or whatever, there's a philosophy of relativism in there that Socrates and Plato are always opposing. Now, by the way, did he just reject what Socrates said about you need philosophy? Yeah, philosophy? yes, he did. Good. Good. So let's see. Here's a person who says, we don't need your philosophy. All well, you need is the appearance of truth. Right. And let's see what he does with it. Oh, go ahead. We can't pass by. Let us then examine it in this way. How? If I should urge you to buy a horse and fight against the invaders, and neither of us knew what a horse was, but I merely knew this about you, that Phaedrus thinks a horse is one of the tame animals which has the longest ears. It would be ridiculous. No, not yet, but if I tried to persuade you in all seriousness, Composing a speech in praise of the ass, which I called a horse, 
and saying that the beast was the most valuable possession at home and in war, that you could use him as a mount in battle, and that he was able to carry baggage and was useful for many other purposes. Then it would be supremely ridiculous. But is it not better to be ridiculous than to be clever and an enemy? To be sure. Then when the orator who does not know what good and evil are undertakes to persuade a state which is equally ignorant, not by praising the shadow of an ass under the name of a horse, but by praising evil under the name of good, and having studied the opinions of the multitude, persuades them to do evil instead of good, well, what harvest do you suppose his oratory will reap thereafter from the seed he has sown? Not a very good harvest. Well, do you think we have reproached the art of speaking too harshly? Perhaps you might say, why do you talk such nonsense, you strange men? I do not compel anyone to learn to speak without knowing the truth. But if my advice is of any value, he learns that first and then acquires me. So, what I claim is this, that without my help, the knowledge of the truth does not give the art of persuasion. Okay, what happened? Great statement, isn't it? Rhetoric is speaking, right? What I claim is this, without my help, the knowledge of the truth does not give the, the art of persuasion. It's not truth anyhow. It's uh, realities. Where, where's, where are you reading? Well, Socrates. there's no reference to truth. Though. What do you, well, do you think? I just glanced at it. So what I claim is this, that without my help, the knowledge of the truth does not give the art of persuasion. Uh, oh, yeah, that's... Okay. Even if he knows the realities, even if he knows the realities. Mm -hmm. So... He, right. But... Mm -hmm. Please... Someone say something. Here, let's go back to it. Well, I mean, the thing that I was just thinking of is that it, it's important that you're saying realities is there because truth is mentioned earlier. <laughs> yes. It does. So, so yeah. we're getting an identity here between truth and and the realities. Tom. Yeah, that, that's a, a person who uh, would do that would be dangerous in a poker game. <laughs> Yeah, even in the same paragraph, right? Yeah, some say the same. Without my help, the knowledge of the reality does not give the art of persuasion. See, he wants to use the idea of truth where it's important, which is in the next paragraph. So read it. Well, so it's, and will she be right in saying this? Yes, the arguments that are coming against her testify that she is an art. For I seem, as it were, to hear some arguments approaching and protesting that she is lying and is not an art, but a craft devoid of art. A real art of speaking, says the Laconian, which does not seize the whole of truth, does not exist and never will. So you know nature, see if you can know the nature of realities, it doesn't give you the art of persuasion, so you know the nature of reality, so what? Right. Okay. On the other hand, the real art of speaking, which doesn't seize hold of truth, does not exist and uh, never will. Mm. Mm. Uh, this was his position he started out with, the grief, Phaedrus started out with us. And what do we now gain from these two? Right, good old knowledge of reality as well as one must seize hold of truth.
if there's going to be a real art of rhetoric. What is this? Mm -hmm. If he accepts this, what does that do to his original position? It's One more down. Refutes it. One more down. One more down. One more down. He's refuted. Oh. Ah. But he doesn't accept it yet. Well, let's see. We need to, <laughs> we need to go next. All right. Come here, then, noble creatures, and persuade, persuade the beautiful child, Phaedrus, that unless he pay proper attention to philosophy, he will never be able to speak properly about anything. Ask your questions. So, if you don't mind, could you do Phaedrus's part? Yeah, first? sure. Yeah. Um, we have need of these arguments, Socrates. Bring them here and examine their words and their meaning. Hmm. Words. True position. Right? We have need of these arguments. Bring them here and examine their words and their meaning. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, yeah, Socrates. That's a bad translation. It's just yeah. examine what they are, what and, they are and how they are, the condition yeah. they're in. Yeah. Go ahead. Come then. Come here then, noble creatures, and persuade the beautiful youth, Phaedrus, that unless he pay proper attention to philosophy, he will never be able to speak properly about anything. That's the take-off point, isn't it? Yes. Now we have a formal restatement, and we've got it. This is now Socrates' position, not Phaedrus. Mm. And now we begin at 261, and we're going to push into that great subject of likeness. Go ahead. Ask your questions. Is not rhetoric in its entire nature an art which leads the soul by means of words, not only in law courts and the various other public assemblies, but in private companies as well. And is it not the same when concerned with small things as with great, and properly speaking, no more to be esteemed in important than in trifling matters? Is this what you have heard? No, by Zeus, okay, not... Now, this is where we started, was it? All right, so what can we discover up to this point? It appears trifling, but in fact, we can see behind it a progressive exploration of the points he's drawing yeah. out from Phaedrus, all his objections, yeah. and dealing with them before he begins the critique of Lysias' speech. Set stage. Hmm. If he didn't do that, Right? Then, like, then Phaedrus would have all of these beliefs, would he not? Right. Mm -hmm. right? Operating while they then tried to make analysis of that speech. He'd be blocked. He'd be blocked. In that sense, like the Mino, he's dealing with the positions one after another so that he'll be empty. Emptying the mind of those attitudes and mannerisms that fit together with the, some kinds of fundamental belief that blocks them from seeing the truth of what's going on. Is that right? <laughs> Ah, ah, I knew it was trifling. <laughs> okay. Um. <sighs> See, what I'd like, like to get into that great paragraph of uh, Phaedrus, then. Okay. Uh, ask your questions. Socrates comes back. Before we do that. That paragraph we just read, and then Phaedrus comes in. No, by Zeus. Go ahead. <coughs> Hold it. It just, it just struck me that um, we've been called, you know, he calls it a leading of the soul. But actually what we've been observing is that, that Phaedrus, uh, Socrates has been going with Phaedrus. You know, he takes what say, mm -hmm. Phaedrus says. I mean, he do, it is a leading of the soul, but he, he, he takes in what Phaedrus says. So mm -hmm. it's a different model of, if you want to call that persuasion, right? Yeah. Because he, he's actually integrating what, and then he's refuting it. Mm -hmm. It's just, that's fascinating to me, to call that a leading of the soul. I mean, it is, but it's an interesting leading. Yes, it is. Well, it, it corresponds to that, um, that paragraph I just read, right, that... It, it's an art that leads a soul by means of words, not only in law courts and other public assemblies, but in private companies private, as well. Such as? The one that they're in. This one we're right in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, another couple of lines. Now, let's have some fun. Go ahead. He goes to another fun game. Would this be uh, 
previously he mentioned right ancient guilt and uh, uh, oracle, uh, not oracle, occultural power, uh, in the like a while ago in the occult, Bible. occult, occult power. power. Oh, the yeah. I was just wondering if he's doing that. The be purging, the purifying, fam ancient family guilt. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, by Zeus, not that exactly. But the art of speaking and writing is exercised chiefly in lawsuits, and that of speaking also in public assemblies. And I have never heard of any further uses. Right. Of? Rhetoric. Rhetoric. Or, uh, by the way. He just rejected the private companies. No, I never heard of any further uses. Even though he just did? He just did? Yeah. <laughs> and he was just exposed to it <laughs> and private dialogue. Hey, I never heard of, I never heard of what we're doing. <laughs> mm. Go ahead. So now he's going to have a little fun. Oh, you haven't? Go ahead. Then you have heard only of the treatise, treatises on rhetoric by Nestor and Odysseus, which they wrote when they had nothing to do with Troy, and you have not heard of that by Palamides? Nor of Nestor's either, unless you are disguising Gorgias under the name of Nestor and Thrasymachos or Theodorus under that of Odysseus. Perhaps I am. However, never mind them, but tell me, what do the parties in a lawsuit do in court? Do they not contend in speech, or what shall we say they do? Exactly that. About the just and the unjust? Yes. Then he who speaking is an art will make the same thing appear to the same persons, at one time just and at another, if he wishes, unjust. Certainly. And in political speaking you will make the same thing seem to the state at one time good and at another the opposite. Just so. Do we not know that the Iliadic Palamides has such an art of speaking that the same things appear to his hearers to be alike and unlike, one and many? stationary and in motion certainly then the art of contention in speech is not confined to courts and political gatherings but apparently if it is an art at all it would be one and the same in all kinds of speaking the art by which a man will be able to produce a resemblance between all things between which it can be produced and to bring to the light the resemblances produced and disguised by anyone else okay let's quit look here resemblance Likeness. Dirty word. See, mm. likeness. Homo likeness. Homo. Likeness is one of the key metaphysical terms in the dialectic. He's picking it up here, and this is the way he's going to introduce it. The whole idea of likeness. Now, every time you see resemblance, put in likeness. From this point on, likeness is the theme. Therefore, it's a good place to quit. Right? Right. Good. Mm -hmm. Because that'll take us where we need to go. Thank you both. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for acting. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> Don't you think we should get them a... Is a, she a good meditator. Is it broken pots and koans? Japanese roshis? Oh, you're being offered as this person. Ah. Oh, or put it this way. All right. Why would it follow, since we're not getting it, <coughs> that the idea of bound and infinite is possible to attribute to, from such an experience or a description of such an experience? <coughs> you would say... Does anyone have an experience of such an experience, but by reflection on that such a thing, we might be able to infer it together. Otherwise, it might be just simply dogmatic. That is, making claims without a basis for, for maintaining them. Right. Well, to be perfectly honest... Good. Uh, Good way to begin. <laughs> I was uh, assuming um, that... Uh, uh, limit and unlimited were higher than likeness and unlikeness. So that's, that's why true. that's why I asked. That's true. Right. I think Proclus says that in the no. commentary. No. So 
Um, that's why I was, well, so I was, uh, wasn't sure if, that's why I've asked, I, I wasn't sure if those two ideas were in that experience. Uh, could, because you, could you repeat the first two, remember the first two you used? Limits and unlimited. Yes. Are they like or unlike? Both. Oh, really? What was your question about them again? <laughs> if uh, limited and unlimited are in the idea of the good. Oh. And now you see that there's a natural connection between them. Since you did agree, did you not? Among the yeah, well, that would mean, wouldn't that mean <clears throat> that likeness is superior? No, but see, it all depends upon how you perceive in your reason. You need a model. <clears throat> and you can reject the model, use another model, and make different conclusions. Right. But uh, would you agree the example that was used tonight was horses and asses? Right. Right? Out of the phages. Agree? Mm -hmm. Would you agree they fall in a certain class? Sure. Right. And yet they are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is some likeness between those two. Right? Agree? Yes. Huh? You might say, no, no, not likeness, just same and different. Could. Yeah. The person who would hold such a position is likely to say, um, if you're willing to say that horses are to asses as truth is, to something that is incapable of generating anything beyond itself, and that's the mark of appearance, then horses are to asses as truth is to some, some sterile there, kind dead, of, right? Dead appearance. Yeah, called appearance. Then we can say a horse is like what's true. Ah, now we're finding a useful likeness different from same and, and other, are we not? Hmm. So likeness emerges in sets of contrast between same and other. So that would mean likeness is yeah. superior to same and other, right? Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Show that that likeness and unlikeness can be generated once you assume that they are same and other, and therefore same and other must precede likeness. But how about? Now, the model we're using is analogies. So you can build the metaphysics out of analogies. <clears throat> so again, that's a, like a different one. So then in that... That, take, that takes us away, by the way, from the issue. But go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't want to take us further. No, the issue is whether or not those two terms, which are, um, go back to your original set. Unlimited, limited. Yeah, yeah. By the way, have you ever had some rather curious and perhaps profound experiences? Sure. Oh, oh, oh. You could put a boundary around it, couldn't you, and talk about it? Yes. Limit. By the way, the experience itself, did it have any limits? No. Therefore? Unlimited. Oh, so therefore we found the idea of limited and unlimited completely consistent with such an experience. Have we not? Mm -hmm. Now we're not using analogies to justify our claim, but appealing to a description or an experience of it to see that it is the case, right? Yes. How about beauty? Could you attribute beauty to that experience? Sure. Oh, good heavens. Oh. Uh, by the way, one thing you could attribute to it, I'm sure, um, appearance? No. Oh, oh, reality? Perfect. Oh, perfect reality. So the idea of reality is equally can be inferred from such an experiment. Mm -hmm. Ah, ah. 
So what are we doing? So we're finding a set of terms which are primary, which can be considered to be a, perhaps a finite set of terms that can be inferred from such an experiment or a description of an experiment. And these can be the primary ideas upon which you can then generate others. So within those ideas, though, they, they, they can be hierarchically arranged, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah which you just did. And how many ideas exactly are in this bound Look, class? You must talk to someone who's good at numbering. I am, <laughs> I am so terrible at arithmetic and things of that nature. <laughs> That's why I said originally, right, that whether or not there's a finite number or not, I'm not sure about that. But weren't you, didn't you guys come up against a conflict that you left between how to <coughs> rank likeness and unlikeness versus bound and limit? It seemed like you noticed that, though originally we, that you guys agreed to that bound and limit were higher than likeness and unlikeness. Peter brought up a point that showed that um, you need the contemplation of likeness and unlikeness to understand bound and limit too, or that, and then you left that. No, I thought it was agreed that limit and unlimited is superior to likeness and unlikeness. Yeah, but didn't didn't Pierre raise a a question that showed that that there is a likeness between bound and unbound? Yeah. That happened. And it didn't problematize or make a It seemed like it gave a problem to you, but... Well, I thought it gave it one to you. Actually, I introduced another set in order to make the point, which is why I went to the example from analogy. Same other. Mm -hmm. Because the idea of limit and unlimited can equally be said to be equivalent to same and other such as, in that experience, did you not find something continuous in it? Sure. Ah, and yet different from other experiences. Other. Yes. Same and other. For if you call it profound, you're saying it's different from another, and therefore right. same and other can follow from such an experience. I use that as a bridge to likeness, using analogy rather than the primary experience. So, the, so, are you saying that bound and unbound are uh, synonymous with same and other? That's what I, that's what we just did. By attributing those terms to that experience, you see. Like it might not fit in some. I wouldn't, uh, that's, I was wondering about that very thing, if, like, how you hierarchically arrange these terms, likeness, limit, same. And we just concluded that it was synonymous, same and other, and right. bound and limit. Right, right. Uh, yeah. What? Well, yeah, that's interesting. Thank yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I'm personally going to grab this off. It's different. <laughs> Those two are different. Why would we use different words if there wasn't some difference? <laughs> Ask them. Let me see. If you're willing to say that those things can be inferred, then you're saying, good heavens, it looks like there's a oneness to it. Mm. Since we identified a set of distinctions which could be inferred from it. And yet there must be a oneness to it. Would you agree? I don't know, before all this talk, I was thinking what I've studied, and that is that you have the one and the henad, which is... Uh, don't need that yet. Okay, well, the one and then limited and unlimited, and then this declension. Yeah, okay. So that's what I had in my mind. No, 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 no. no. Okay. You're not going to be able to solve your puzzle with that. But if you go in a few moments, in a couple of steps, you might be able to. Okay. 
Right. Would you agree we found a certain multiplicity that could be inferred from one thing? Yes. And therefore, could we not say those distinctions that we found, nonetheless, all belong to that same one thing? Right. They have a oneness, then, do they not? Mm -hmm. Ah, a unity is a oneness, is it not? Mm -hmm. So they can, what must exist before those things can come into a unity must be unity itself, must it not? Yes. Ah, therefore, unity itself is, you know, and therefore, pure oneness must reflect the nature of the one itself. And did that? Yeah. Good. Now that's using metaphysics to arrange them hierarchically, which was the point you were just making. <clears throat> That's different from experience. Hmm? That's different from the language that's used in, when talking about the experience. <coughs> There's always a difference. <coughs> There's always a difference between metaphysics and descriptions of experience. And someone must sooner or later find a way to bridge that difference. But nonetheless, metaphysics proceeds by uh, uh, while it may refer to experience. It proceeds by reasoning, and therefore, you may end up with a rational system that doesn't match your experience, or it does. That's separate. What's the separate issue? Um, that's purpose. That's purpose is problem. So, is there a different way of relating to the primary ideas than through metaphysics as a way of approaching the experience? You're like. If we could talk about all the rankings and the system of metaphysics, there's one sort of language that comes up. It's this intellectual approach to the experience itself. How would, what would be a different way of more kind of, I don't want to use the word natural, but less intellectual way of relating to those primary ideas and the experience itself? You can make you can make just logical distinctions among certain classes of objects that for which you may not find a parallel range of experience to match them. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but you can also find a metaphysics that does try to match them. At which case, often, you'll find that uh, the meta rational metaphysics may, be, may go beyond the conditions of experience. Does that in any way assist you in maintaining the states of mind of the experience, or getting back into it? Or? Well, um, I'm not sure I get the full force of your question before I open my mouth. So. Like, it may be nice to read lots of Platonic metaphysics, but does that bring you closer to the states of mind, or provide access to them? Um, the assumption of Proclus, which is where you find the, the, the most fully developed rational system of metaphysics, it's his primary claim that understanding system itself is a yoga. So, I love purpose. And therefore, so spiritual system. So then, that would be a yes answer. Yeah. yeah. But when, when you talk about the experience itself, it doesn't sound like there's distinctions of hierarchies between ideas drawn. Like if, if unbound and, and same and other are synonymous, oh, see, what we're, is the <clears throat> distinction? We're, we're in the Phaedrus. The primary goal of the Phaedrus is to make distinctions in a whole range of, of, of spiritual or profound experiences. That's a goal. So, and so he makes a good number of them and uh, puts them in a myth. Therefore, it's somewhat like the ox herding pictures. Wow. In at so far to, as... At least up to the eighth. I'm sorry. It's something like the ox herding pictures insofar as? That they are hierarchical. There is a set of experiences that can be arranged hierarchically. And that is equally true of the ox herding pictures. Mm -hmm. 
But and the failure is the only goes as far as the eighth. Because that's his goal. Mm. It was the eighth. Oh wait, not even in the not even in the ascent to the upper not even in the ascent to the banquet of, of the gods and no. that's still the eighth? Okay. I'll have to look at it again and look at the eighth. Well, we can bug it now. Why is the ninth and the tenth not there, too? Like, what is it about the ninth and the tenth that we don't find in the figures? Well, he said well, it's the goal. Goal. It's not his goal. His goal is... That's okay. okay. His, goal. his goal is... I'm just talking about the details of the speech. Like, did, uh, did you add something with that last phrase? Well, I'm, I'm not sure you did. Therefore, I'm pausing. No, go ahead. Please continue. Well, the goal is, is to... Uh, is similar to the symposium, which is to uh, get a clear vision of the nature of ultimate reality. Okay. Well, that's not the good. That's not the good. Mm -hmm. so, so, what does what's in the ninth and the tenth Oxford pictures that isn't there? In that's not the point. The point would be, what is the eighth that would can, that one could make the claim? that it's parallel to a vision of the nature of reality. Okay. Okay, are you familiar with the eighth auction? I haven't looked at it in a while. Okay, then. This discussion would depend upon someone recalling it. My memory is very bad as everybody knows. Yeah, just like you were able to not, yeah. not remember. It's true, that has it's been not The fact that it stops at the eighth. <laughs> well, doesn't it go, fat guy hearing, carrying sack, and then before that is the circle, and then what is before that? Can anybody bring it back? So is that the hut? The circle is the eighth. The circle oh. is the eighth. Oh. Ah. So what's the Then start? living in a hut with the moon behind faintly showing itself is the ninth and the tenth is the Dharma bomb. Oh. Yeah, and regrettably, we still don't have what the eighth no. is, <laughs> except that it's a circle. <laughs> Rats. Oh, does anybody recall any of the, the words? Let's... Yeah, so let's drop that then. Okay. <laughs> wow. It's homework. I don't remember anything. So there's, not, oh, there's nothing about living in a hut. How many years of instruction? There's nothing about living in a hut in uh, the famous. <laughs> right, let's follow up. You're just going to have to stay with the same point, right? If I chicken out now, it's going to have to change everything I've said. You're right. Uh, <laughs> No, I just, I, just, I just thought it was funny. Well, well, they are outside in nature, aren't they? Hmm? Aren't they outside and walking around in nature, just sort of like the ox and the folks, you know, in those pictures? Well, the ox herding pictures, there are only four that are ox herding pictures out of ten. <laughs> Is it brought up? Is it an important point to make distinctions between metaphysical classes in order to reach to these different states of mind along the spiritual path? Like, is that I didn't? I don't know what you guys read tonight because it showed up late. But are those distinctions between same and other and like and unlike brought up in in the Phaedrus? No, uh, different kind, different so different goals. That's why it's different dialogue. So I was but wondering thing, but, about but, that. But likeness does come up. Mm -hmm. This is where our conversation, mm -hmm. which is where this discussion mm -hmm. has came from, and we read mm -hmm. the part that contains mm -hmm. the idea tonight. Mm -hmm. The likeness of following them in the different trains of the gods, or no, no, we no. The section on rhetoric brings up the idea of likeness to explore the art of speech or the rhetoric resemblance, and and knowing the truth, um, mm -hmm. that aspect of rhetoric where and he reality. says that you must know the truth. And reality. Right. Right. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> the truth and reality to, to have the art of speech in the first place. But you can have it, but you can know the truth and not have the art of speech. But to have the art of speech, you must know the truth first. <clears throat> I remember. I'm still wondering if there's another way of approaching then, like outside of a metaphysical system, another way of approaching those fundamental ideas or forms that's more true than to experience, or more true than to the descriptions of reality, of approaching reality in the Phaedrus. Right. 
rather than to, rather than through an intellectual system. Well, it's going to be quite a few of them in the papers. Sounds like home. Not really. That's his goal. What's your question? I, I didn't. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Watch out where there's a, a vocabulary available in the Phaedrus that can represent such a spiritual quest, independent of finding metaphysical terms that can be inferred from such an experience. Is that your point? Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll take that for a too. You want to know if the Phaedrus contains a language that can describe this spiritual experience independent of finding the terms that you can derive from that experience? Yeah. And, and the answer is yes to that? I forgot. What do you think? Yes. Okay. So what do you ask me for? Well, <laughs> I'm a little I'm I'm asking me for I'm confused <laughs> about that because it, it, it's... I'll look good when you're agreeing with him when he already agrees with the point, right? Excellent idea. Well, <laughs> how can you do that? Right, if there's a certain class of terms or set of terms that are derivable from the experience of reality and truth, how does it that you find a way of describing? This is so crispy, you see, that you have to talk louder than the crispy sound. <laughs> right? Otherwise, let someone else answer it while I continue crisping my way through this cooker. <laughs> how, how is it that you can describe uh, oh, that big, big. spiritual experience that big, big. without the set of terms that you can derive from that experience? Our questions are easy. I'm Metaphysical. Right? Our questions are easy. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> Did you mean a how? Yeah. Oh, well, using proper words. <laughs> That's what I said, you know, don't ask a how question because they're usually just a little better than yes and no. Am I, am I um, overstepping the situation? Because one of the impressions that I got when we were starting to talk at the last there was that essentially, you know, what Socrates is doing is unlocking the chains and turning the kid around and looking at the fire and saying, hey kid, this is what you, you know, have been thinking. You know, and you got to learn to distinguish, you know, between these silly shadows and that silly fire and let me drag you up here a little ways and see what you can see. The only trouble is, you see, that to drag him up already assumes the fetters have been released <clears throat> and he's not there yet. Oh, I, I didn't say that yeah. was at, at that point, but I just kept thinking. Yes, it is. Though. is yeah. it, that's the process that's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he someone coming down and questioning? Right, him. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, quite true. Yeah, that's what he's doing. And, uh, the, uh, the higher question, going back to where we were, is would that be a way of reversing or freeing someone from fate to destiny? See, so he has no, Phaedrus has no idea of destiny, he has, he has no, he can't deal with that term. Yet that was the object of a good part of the Phaedrus. So it's, see, it's really real curious dialogue because it's the theme of likeness and unlikeness. Is really the, the guy is really a, quite a genius. Uh, the non-lover is to the lover as unlikeness is to likeness. The first two speeches are the non-lover. Right? The third speech is the true, the true idea of love, the lover. <clears throat> and the whole art of rhetoric is to know sameness and difference in respect to likeness and unlikeness. Mm -hmm. And he's telling them, hey, you know what? Your speech, you know, 
I'll point out all the shortcomings it has, especially the first one, you know, that it begins at the conclusion. <clears throat> it has no proper body of parts. They're not arranged in any way. So then we can look at his speech and say, hey, now let us apply the same argument to his. And then we can see, therefore, the difference between likeness as a property of Socrates' the speech of the lover as unlikenesses to the property of the non-lover. So therefore he has dialectic, dialectic between unlikeness and likeness, which is the, one of the paramount ideas of the metaphysics and, as we just mentioned, central out of it, such an experience to be able to make such detriments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a rather clever, you know? So he doesn't have to use likeness and unlikeness to, to, dis, to discuss this, that experience. I think that was the point you were making to, to Josh, that we don't need to discuss the experience, the spiritual experience, in terms of these metaphysical classes or categories um, to describe the experience and the opposite of it. Now, see, the, the problem that he has is that when he talks about his own speech, or <clears throat> if we apply it to his own speech, then the distinctions he is making between each of the points that unfold in that myth of his is so close one to the other. The similitude or the likeness between them is very slight. And therefore, it's our job to try to discover distinctions between those things in the myth and to find out if there are differences significant to note and learn from. Just as it's opposite in the Phaedrus or Lysis speech, it's the opposite. So, it, um, and that's the art of rhetoric, isn't it? Being able to, to know when likeness is being used and when do you have most difficulty it's when the subject is akin, so akin that you might, by slight steps, come to a conclusion in error because the differences are so slight as you proceed in that chain of reasoning. And it's a, yeah. You know, well, you know, the criticism against Friday night is really severe. You know, that we're just a bunch of slow readers. Here we are, trying to get into pages. We haven't even gotten into page one yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, just bad. All, all the way around, isn't it? You know, what do you think, Joe? Well, the first week I came in, I was ready for page one. That's what I read. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly we're in the middle. <laughs> Hmm. I, I think so too. Thank you. Thank you.